You are performing this repair at your own risk. We cannot be held responsible for any injuries or damage done to your device while attempting a repair. For this repair, we'll need a small flathead screwdriver, small Phillips screwdriver, plastic pry tool, four plastic clamps for clamping down our new screen, a heat gun for softening the current adhesive around the perimeter of the glass and aiding in glass removal, replacement pre-cut adhesive strips for adhering our new screen, and of course our replacement screen which includes the front glass, the digitizer, and the LCD. Typically, the device still functions fine. The glass is just cracked. We still get touch sensitivity from our digitizer and our LCD displays just fine. These three components are not separable. So be sure to purchase this full screen assembly or you won't be completing this repair successfully. On the iPod we'll be repairing, the corners have not been dented. It's common for this to occur and in this case the replacement screen will not fit unless we take the pliers and bend out the casing. Depending on the damage, another option is to actually cut out a chunk of the plastic bezel and this may accommodate the new screen. If the dent is minor, you may be able to make room for the new screen by scraping away at the bezel with a small flathead screwdriver or metal pry tool. We'll start by powering off our device. Now using a heat gun or hair dryer, apply heat around the perimeter focusing on the top and bottom portions. This should be done for about 30 seconds with a heat gun and one minute with a hair dryer. Apply packaging tape over the affected areas to keep them intact. To remove the old screen, insert the metal tool in between the glass and plastic bezel. Do not attempt to get underneath the bezel. We can then slide our metal tool underneath the screen and begin to lift it away from the adhesive. Keep the metal pry tool as level as possible with the glass. Now there is adhesive around the entire perimeter of the screen. However, it's only necessary to pry up the bottom just enough to allow us to slide our metal tool inward towards the center of the screen. This will give us all the leverage needed to lift out the screen. You'll see this shortly. When prying in areas where the glass is badly cracked, you'll notice the glass will break up and it will make the removal a bit more difficult. In general, the more intact your screen remains, the easier the repair. Avoid prying directly underneath the home button. Also, do not pry in the top portion of the screen. There are many components in this area that can be damaged. In the center and bottom portion of the screen, there is a metal insert below which protects components in these areas. Continue to apply heat as necessary. Keeping the adhesive soft around the perimeter will make the removal less challenging. Continue working at the bottom portion of the screen. Once you're able to lift the glass out about a quarter inch on the bottom, you should be able to slide the metal tool under the middle area of the glass where the LCD is located. This will give you all the leverage needed to fold the glass up towards the top. You can't do this immediately because the LCD is about a quarter inch thick on the back side of the center portion of the glass. You can get a better idea at where the LCD is located and the thickness by looking at your replacement screen. It's important to keep the screen at an angle as shown because the Wi-Fi antenna sticks to the glass near the top and can tear if we aren't careful. Using a small flat head, you can safely peel the antenna away from the glass. With the Wi-Fi antenna now free from the adhesive, we can continue to fold the screen upwards towards the top and the LCD cable should unplug on its own. If it doesn't, you can use a small flathead or plastic pry tool to get underneath the plug and lift it away from its port. We can now fold the screen over and pull it away from the remaining adhesive at the top. The only cable still connecting the screen is the digitizer cable, which plugs in underneath of the logic board. Now it will take some effort before we get access to this port, so since we're replacing the screen anyway, we'll go ahead and cut that cable for our convenience so that the screen is entirely separated from the iPod. Two pieces need to be recovered from your old glass. The first is a home button, which peels away as shown. Be sure to remove any excess glass that's attached to this piece. The second piece is a top metal bracket. This is also held on with adhesive and can be peeled away with your metal pry tool. These parts will be used on our replacement screen. Our next step will be to remove all old adhesive and remaining glass from the iPod. Two helpful tools for this are the metal pry tool and small flathead screwdriver. The pry tool is used for the large strips at the bottom, and the small flathead can be used around the remaining perimeter to scrape away the adhesive. 
The plastic bezel that goes around the perimeter is white, while the adhesive tape is black, so you'll know when all old adhesive has been removed. On the black version of this model, it's obviously not as easy to tell. We now have a total of eight Phillips screws being pointed out here that will need to be removed. As you remove each screw, you can lay it out in a square off to the side so that you know where these screws go on reassembly. Here we're using a magnetic screwdriver, which makes the removal, and even more so, the reassembly, much easier. All screwdrivers in our toolkit are magnetized. Remember that the reason for the continued disassembly is that the digitizer cable up top plugs in underneath the logic board. And we cannot access this port unless we continue with the steps being shown. Using the metal pry tool, wedge in between the rear camera and its metal cover to remove this piece. We'll set this aside until reassembly. There are two more Phillips screws up top that will eventually need to be removed. Keeping them in place now will prevent the board from coming upwards and possibly damaging the power button cable while removing the metal plate. Here we're removing a piece of adhesive covering the power volume flex cable, which we'll need to be careful of when prying up this metal plate. There are two areas of adhesive where we'll need to pry in order to remove this metal plate. As usual, we'll apply heat in the areas of the adhesive to allow for an easier removal. Now using our plastic pry tool, we'll wedge underneath the metal plate in the areas shown here. Be extremely careful of the power volume flex cable. If you tear this cable, it's a complicated process to replace and requires soldering. Instead of pulling upwards with our pry tool, we'll carefully twist it so that we push down on the board, yet lift up on the metal insert. You should feel the metal insert start to come away from its hole in the double-sided tape. Next, move to the second area of adhesive. Here the adhesive is attached to the internal speaker. We'll need to separate the metal plate from its hole in the speaker so that we don't pull the speaker out. The speaker is attached by two wires that are soldered to the board. You may find it easier to use a metal pry tool instead of the plastic for this area. The metal plate should start to come up freely, but we still need to proceed with caution to be sure that the board does not pull up with the metal plate, as this would cause a power volume flex cable to tear. Also, make certain that the speaker is not pulling up with the plate, because those wires will rip right off of the board. There's a copper ground adhered to the back side of the rear facing camera, which runs underneath the metal plate. Try not to tear this copper tape when you pull out the metal insert. Peel the tape away from the camera as shown in the video. If it does tear, it's not a big deal, just be sure the two pieces of copper touch on reassembly. If the wires from the internal speaker are pulled out by accident, it's not difficult to replace this part. There are two small solder points, and the wires can actually be soldered to the top connection instead of the bottom, as originally manufactured. This will make the process much easier. Now for the two screws at the top. Before we remove them, acknowledge the power flex cable. This cable is commonly torn when we pull up the board, so you want to be careful and make sure that the board is not catching the cable and tearing it. This would also require replacing the power flex cable. We'll want to pull up this rear facing camera, which is inside of its opening, and held in with a slight adhesive. If we don't pull it out now, when we go to pull up the board, the camera will sit in place, and it's possible to bend the cable and damage the camera. So I'll go ahead and remove these two screws, which again will allow us to lift up the board and blindly plug in the digitizer cable. Before we can lift the board out, it will need to be pulled a tiny amount in the direction shown due to an overlap. Remember to be very cautious of this power volume flex cable. Keeping your finger on it will remind you that the board needs to come out at an angle as shown. By lifting the board out at an angle, it will prevent the power volume flex cable from being damaged, yet give us access to the digitizer port for plugging in our new screen. By bending the board up slightly in this area, 
who will bring the board away from the power cable up top. You should also use a small flathead to ensure that the board is not catching the cable. It's all too common for this portion of the cable to tear, so be extremely careful because this too requires replacing the power volume flex cable. Watch here as we lift the board up slightly and ensure that it passes the power cable without tearing it. Now we have the front facing camera to note. The cable has some adhesive which adheres it to the bottom back panel of the iPod. So we'll need to get under there with our flathead and free this from its adhesive because this camera is plugged in underneath the logic board on the opposite side of where the LCD plugs in on the top. So if we don't free it from the adhesive, the camera will become unplugged and we'll have to re-plug it in. And plugging something in underneath the board is not fun. Here's a look underneath the board so you can see exactly where the camera cable is located and how to peel it up from the back casing of the iPod. Before we can unplug the digitizer cable, we'll have to remove the copper tape which surrounds it. When the tape is split to the sides of the top, we're able to unplug the digitizer cable. Again, this cable plugs in at the bottom, and what we can do is take our small flathead, get in between the board and the cable, and give it a gentle twist. And that cable should unplug no problem and we can slide it out from underneath of the board. Now remember, be careful about the power volume flux cable. Hold your finger there for support. To prep our replacement screen, start by removing the two plastic protectors. Next, reinstall the home button. The adhesive around the rubber should be enough to hold it in place. If not, you can use super glue gel. Next, adhere the metal bracket at the top. Note the two windows in the replacement screen. One is for the light sensor, which controls auto brightness, and the other is for the front facing camera. The old adhesive already on this piece should be enough to re-adhere it. If it's not, you can use a small amount of super glue gel. Now when installing the screen, plugging the digitizer cable will be the most difficult part. We have to blindly plug this in using a small flathead and pushing upward. You have to be sure that the cable is lined up or it won't go in. This will take you a lot longer than shown in the video. With the cable securely plugged in, we'll push the logic board slightly towards the side pointed out so it can get underneath the lip and push it flush with the iPod. Then push in the rear facing camera. Once the board is flush inside the iPod, reinsert the two Phillips screws located at the top. The smaller of the two holds down the front facing camera, while the larger one holds down the board near the power button. Next, we'll put the large metal plate back in place. There are two metal tabs on the side shown that will first need to be tucked in before we can flip the board down as shown in the video. If you're having issues getting this metal plate down, it's possible if the speaker has moved out of place and you'll need to push it back into place before you can set this plate flush. Also, remember to tuck down the copper ground on top of the rear facing camera. With the plate flush and all screw holes lining up, we'll reinsert the eight Phillips screws around the perimeter of this plate. Reinstall the metal camera cover on the back side of the rear camera. Next, we'll be applying the pre-cut adhesive strips at the top and bottom of the iPod. We'll start at the bottom, remove our adhesive strip, and use a small flathead to run it along the bezel to prevent the tape from overlapping the bezel. Next, remove the squares covering the screw holes. Next, flip the screen down and lay it towards the bottom so that we have room at the top to apply our adhesive. Use the same technique as before, 
and run your small flathead along this thin piece of tape so that it does not overlap the bezel. Before we remove the paper backing from the double sided tape, we're going to plug in our screen and power up our device for testing. Do not set the screen flush with the iPod during the test. Thoroughly verify that your LCD displays properly and your touch screen responds everywhere. Power your device off and carefully unplug the LCD cable. Remove the paper backing from the top layer of adhesive. Now flip the screen back over towards the top and remove the paper backing from the bottom layer of adhesive. What we're going to do here is apply super glue gel, which doesn't run like original super glue. It's important that you use the gel and not regular super glue. And we're going to apply the gel on top of the adhesive. This will make for a stronger bond. Also, because the glue is in between the double sided adhesive and the screen, it's not permanent. It's not part of the iPod. So if you ever need to replace the screen again, it won't be a problem. Be conservative with the amount of super glue gel you use. It doesn't take much for it to do its job. Apply small dots about a quarter inch apart. If you apply too much gel, it will go in spots that are unwanted. For example, inside of the iPod or on the top layer of the glass. So once you close the screen, you'll see super glue residue around the perimeter. With the adhesive in place, we're ready to close our screen. Make sure the digitizer cable is bent properly. If it overlaps the screen, it can crack the LCD when you go to close it. Here we're plugging in the LCD cable. Once you have it positioned over the port, it shouldn't take much force to plug it in. If it's not positioned right over the port and you press too hard, it can damage the connector. Make note of the digitizer cable and how it's bent. This is very important. Flip the glass over and keep it raised above the adhesive. Power on your device. We'll be setting the top portion of the screen in place first. The metal lip on the back side of the screen at the top will need to sit under the bezel. So you'll need to overlap the glass at the bottom and bring it up towards the top as you're setting the top portion flush. Look for any distortion on the LCD screen. This looks similar to when you put pressure on an LCD computer monitor. This means that the screen is not sitting right inside the iPod and you're at risk of damaging the LCD part of the screen assembly. If you see this, you should reposition the screen and also check for glass residue, etc. that may be inside the iPod. Work your way around the glass to ensure it's flush on all sides. Be cautious about how much pressure you put on the screen because the glass can crack on install. If you find it difficult to get the screen entirely flush on every side, it's likely that a corner was bent inward during the drop that cracked the display in the first place. You'll need to either bend that part out or chisel away some more at the bezel. With the screen flush, run your finger on the perimeter and apply a light pressure to secure the screen's bond with the adhesive. Applying heat to the areas where the adhesive is located will temporarily soften the adhesive, making it extra tacky for a stronger bond. Our final step is to apply plastic clamps around the corners of the screen and let the new screen set for 25 minutes. Two commonly encountered issues following replacement are getting only a white backlit screen or getting no display at all, a black screen. If you get the white screen, resetting the device almost always solves the issue. In the case that your power button was damaged, the reset will not register and you'll need to restore it in iTunes. But be aware that restoring your device will erase all content from the device, so be sure to back it up. If you get the black screen, you should also first try resetting the device. If resetting doesn't work, check the LCD cable. Unplug and replug this cable in. This is the easier of the two to access, which plugs in on top of the logic board. If this still doesn't solve the problem, be sure that your device has a charge. Check us out on the web at GadgetMenders.com, where you'll find a full line of parts, tools, and repair services for this device and many others. Thanks for watching.